Hiya folks, this is Perry again. Uh, it's been a while. Uh, today I wanted to share with you a story and uh, a little bit of background and diagnosis on a problem with a dryer that a friend of mine had. So he has an electric dryer and uh, as with uh, most appliances they have safety elements built into them uh, to prevent them from burning down your house and you inside with it. Uh, so anyway, uh, his dryer was sort of built like this. Um, there's like a duct on the back of it, and inside this duct is a heating element made of nichrome wire, which is a nickel chromium uh, alloy. And it's what they make heating elements, hair dryers, etc. It's what they use for the actual heating element. So inside the dryer, uh, you've got the connections uh, to the heating element coming out right here and then uh, you have a, a switch up here and a switch down here and both of these switches uh, they actually sense heat from the airstream so there's a, a airstream blowing through this and this one right here senses the air blowing past the heating element and this one down here is much closer to the bottom of the element where the air is coming in and uh, so the way these switches work or what they're called is um, this one is called a thermal fuse so uh, the part number for this you'll find on the internet is 309 F and then what they call this down here is a limit switch and there doesn't seem to be a real commonality uh, with the limit switch but this was a whirlpool dryer and uh, these parts you can find a kit online for five bucks to replace both of these switches now the problem that he had with this uh, dryer is that uh, it would you know it would run but it wouldn't get hot and the way that they wire up the dryer is uh, they have power coming in to this thermal fuse, power coming out of the thermal fuse to the limit switch, and then the limit switch actually feeds power to the heating element, and then from the heating element they have a return. And so this switch is in series with this switch, and the way that these work is a thermal fuse is, is kind of like what you expect. If you've ever dealt with your car and you blow a fuse and you got to replace it, it's a one-time blow item. Now the limit switch is the actual thermostat which turns on and off this heating element as the dryer is running. And the limit switch is a, it's a bimetallic switch. I'll go into how these two switches are constructed later. But this is a bimetallic switch and then this is just a one-time um, you know, heat uh, heat activated fuse and so the way that you diagnose this and and you know there's other YouTube videos on how to diagnose uh, dryers and whatnot but I had experienced a similar failure on the furnace in my trailer so what happened was this thermal fuse cut out and so power couldn't get to the limit switch and therefore power wouldn't get to the the coil that heats everything and the simple way of, of actually testing these is that this is what's called a normally closed switch, which means this switch will pass current uh, electricity in its normal state. It just, that's what it does. It acts like it's not there unless it trips. And the limit switch is the same way. So this one, uh, you should be able to use a, an ohm meter or a test light or anything that tests continuity to check whether or not these switches have continuity. And we found the limit switch had continuity, but the thermal fuse did not have continuity. And so uh, I ruled that the thermal fuse was actually the failure in uh, the dryer. He ordered the $5 kit and he got his you know, $300 dryer working again. Now the reason why I bring this up is that this is actually a very common failure for appliances. Now you would assume that the thermal fuse, oh no, the sky is falling. The reason they put the thermal fuse in there is, let's say for instance, uh, your dryer vent gets completely clogged and there's no airflow through it. So uh, for whatever reason, the exhaust from the dryer can't go anywhere. So 
you've got this fan inside that's just continuously circulating hot air inside the dryer and eventually it gets too hot and this thermal fuse will shut off. Now, that's entirely possible what happened with his you know, dryer. I know that in my case with my furnace, that wasn't the case. The switch failed prematurely. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into how these two switches are made. And uh, we actually tore the thermal fuse apart. It was kind of interesting. So let me uh, erase this. Now, the, uh, the thermal fuse, let's start with the contacts. So you have an incoming power contact and then you have a secondary contact that comes over here and uh, these contacts are actually sprung so what happens is <laughs> uh, you have these two contacts which I'm thinking okay so these two contacts normally are touching each other. They've got a little set of contacts that are actually silvered and uh, so these normally touch each other and there's actually a little ceramic piece which comes up through the center of it. It's a little ceramic post. These are kind of offset a little bit. So there's a little ceramic post that acts as both an electrical insulator and a thermal insulator. And then there's a disc, a deflecting disc. Now this disc, the best guess of how I think this is manufactured, because this is not a bimetallic material, meaning it's only a single uh, type of metal, it's not two types of metal that are actually laminated together. So this disc has a dome to it. And the way they do that is when they punch it out of a piece of metal, they have a die that is domed. And so whenever they punch it, that die imparts, that dome in the die imparts a stress in the material. So whenever it comes out of the die, it kind of looks like this. That's an exaggerated view. But anyway, so that normally the material is flat, but when it comes out of the die, it has a, a dome like this. Now, what's happened, and this is, this is what's called oil canning. What's happened is the edges of the material have shrunk as part of the actual uh, you know, cutting process. So there's stresses in the edge of the material which causes that edge to shrink. Now, what happens with this material is uh, when it gets hot, so normally, you, so this is your what you would call your, your stressed state, where the thermal fuse is doing its job and it's passing current. When the thermal fuse gets hot, what happens is that disc relaxes. And when that disc relaxes, it pushes this little ceramic element down against that contact and opens the contact. Now, an interesting uh, side effect of the way this is designed is that uh, while this edge is shrunk right here, and you've relaxed the metal, uh, and it's pushed that little you know, ceramic pin, you can't reset it. However, you know, if you were to like drill a little hole in the bottom, and then push on the back of this contact, you could potentially reset it. When we took it apart, I was able to uh, bend that material back and forth. So, so, in summary, what happens is, you've got this switch, where you've got a, a little disc of metal, and that metal has stress in it from being punched. The edges themselves have shrunk. So it creates like a coin that goes pink, 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 pink. And whenever this metal gets hot to a specified temperature, it relaxes to an unstressed state. And when it's in that unstressed state, it actually pushes the ceramic insulator back and opens the circuit. So it's a one-time fuse. Now, these switches right here as a pair of two sell for about $5. Now the rule of thumb, and some might argue with me, is that when you manufacture something, the retail cost is about five times the manufacturing cost. So let's say you've got a dollar to make these two, to make two switches like this. Now, I'm going to be realistic. I don't think that this switch costs 50 cents to make. 
I would be betting you dollars to donuts that that switch was no more than a quarter to 35 cents. So here you have is a 35 cent part. 35 cent part makes a $350 dryer non-functional. So that's a factor of 100. Am I saying that right? So 35, it'd be 35 bucks. Three, no, it's a factor of a thousand. So you've got a part that's one thousandth the cost of the actual retail item of that uh, retail cost of the dryer that makes the dryer stop working. And this, my friends, is why used appliance guys make a killing because they get these things for free. You put five dollars of parts in them, and voila, they've got a two hundred dollar dryer they can sell, or a hundred dollar dryer, whatever it may be. So I'm going to circle back now to the bimetallic uh, switch, the thermal, you know, the limit switch as they call it. Uh, I would just call it a thermostat, whatever. So a bimetallic switch is just like what we saw before. You've got a set of contacts. I'm drawing them the same color this time, yes. So you've got a set of contacts and then you've got little, you know, uh, little uh, silver buttons on there and then you have your little ceramic uh, insulator which you know that's it doesn't line up on the top there but suffice it to say it's a similar design but what you have is instead of a single punched out disc is that you've got a punched out disc that has two types of metal now these two types of metal and I don't know off the top of my head what they are. Those two types of metal are actually laminated together, meaning they've taken the two pieces of metal and they have bonded them together using some, you know, method. And what happens is these two different these two pieces of metal, they have different coefficients of expansion, which means whenever they get hot, they expand at different rates. Now, why that makes a difference is that you've got one metal that expands slower than the other metal. And the metal that expands faster is the side that's going to dome. So when this thing gets hot, the green metal expands, it pushes the little ceramic you know, uh, insulator down, opens the contact, and then what happens is whenever it cools down, the blue metal contracts and it pulls this back straight to its natural or relaxed state. It may also be that these are manufactured in the same sense where they're punched out of a, a piece of laminate material and they have that stress in the ridge, you know, in the edges. So they're naturally a dome shape and that whenever they heat up they relax but then they contract back to the dome shape. It, it's very likely that's the way it is. And these are, like I said, these are 35 cent parts that control a $350 appliance. So, Instead of you know getting upset and, and wanting to throw out your dryer or you know drop 400 bucks or whatever at Home Depot, consider this: if you do a little bit of poking around in the back, which they don't include schematics in most dryers that I found, you've got uh, refrigerators. Often I can find like schematics, air conditioners, uh, washing machines, dishwashers. Oftentimes they'll have a piece of paper inside of them that has the schematic on it. But this dryer didn't have any paperwork whatsoever inside of it. So all I did, you know, just Google the part number on the internet, and then uh, the thermal switch had a, a few different numbers on it. It had 309F, which is sort of like a generic part number, and then it had a specific, you know, Kenmore, well, Whirlpool part number that was like six digits. And, you know, do a little Googling around the internet, and boom, $4.52, and, you know, you've got two switches, uh, it's a repair kit. Uh, the new switches may not look exactly like the old switches because uh, there is some variation in manufacture, but what I did find is that the dryer was actually made to accept two different styles of switch. 
So uh, the switch, the replacement that he got was the second style, and you know they included everything that they needed to you know retrofit that switch, including a set of contacts. So if the contacts to the you know switches and the heating element go bad uh, due to overheating or whatnot, then they include new crimp contacts that you can put on those. All for four dollars and fifty-two cents. I couldn't believe that. I thought for sure, yeah, fifteen bucks for you know switch or whatever, but two switches for four dollars and fifty-two cents. Well, I appreciate you sitting through this and uh, watching this. It's uh, I know it's dense uh, subject matter, and you know my whiteboard skills are probably not up to snuff. But if you like the video, give me a thumbs up and uh, share it. Thanks for watching. Bye.